Good morning. My name is Raven Wallace. I graduated from Banneker High School yesterday. As exciting as that was, I am just proud to be a Supreme Team here at Raymond Rec Center with DC Department of Parks and Recs. Thanks to Mayor Bowser and DPR, I have been able to grow my social circle, travel outside of DC, and most importantly, get paid year round through Department of Employment Services. Through their internship program, while in school and next week, I will begin my summer job here at Raymond. I look forward to being a camp counselor at DPR's Discovery Camp. The person I am introducing has been a tremendous help to me without ever us meeting. Through her leadership, teens are always a priority in DC. It is my pleasure to introduce Mayor Muriel Bowser. Give Raven another big round of applause. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Raymond Recreation Center. Let's hear it for DPR. This Recreation Center has a special place in my heart. We've worked real hard over the years to deliver it during my tenure, and now we see a uh, wonderful renovation to the school also happening. Uh, we have uh, a lot of graduates. We just heard from one Banneker Achiever, and we have our D.C. public school students have one more day of school. So to the public education team, congratulations on a, uh, a wonderful, wonderful um, school year. Uh, and I know uh, that you get started on your summer programming probably in, what, like an hour? Uh, but Chancellor Farabee, Superintendent Grant, Deputy Mayor Paul Kine, our public charter school uh, leaders and educators, and the 100,000 children in D.C. schools. Give them a big round of applause. So I want to give our teachers, principals, school support staff, um, a, a, our kudos and appreciation. Uh, this has been an incredibly important school year for our students to catch up on all the learning and socialization uh, that they missed during the pandemic. And uh, it is also the time where we want to make sure, as they have and as we promise, that they are experiencing the joy, the energy, and uh, the excitement of their school experiences. And so many of our young people are doing wonderful things, uh, not just in school, but also in their communities. And we want to make sure our kids wake up every day um, making good choices, and we want them to be proud. But now that the school year is coming to a close, we talk about how we have to keep the momentum going for the summer. We know how critical it is to keep young people engaged in safe activities during the summer. And when summer arrives, it's time for the Department of Parks and Recreation and our Department of Employment Services to shine. So give them a big round of applause. I want to thank DPR Director Thinny Freeman, DOAS Director Unique Morris Hughes, uh, and I want to thank uh, DC Public Schools and our public education team, because I like to tell people we have summer jobs, summer camp, and summer school. And on Monday, uh, we officially kick off the DPR park season. We've expanded our park offerings to 13,000 slots. That includes DPR boost camps, which we launched in the... Yeah, good. DPR boost camps, which we launched um, for kids ages 11 to 13 that combine fun and learning, but learning's fun. Uh, and right here at Raymond, for example, kids can take a two-week rocket camp where they will learn to design, construct, and launch 
multiple rockets. So I think um, we're going to try one of the rocket games today. Um, so parents and caregivers can go to dprsummercamp.com to check out what's available. Uh, we will also have our 44th year of the Marion Barry Youth Employment Program. And this year, DOES will have 14,000 kids signed up, which means 14,000 kids making money, meeting new mentors, and learning skills that they will carry throughout their lives. So uh, our young people will also be starting on Monday. We expect you to be on time, to come with a good attitude, and to make the most of your experience. Uh, so we know how important these months are for our young folks, and it's not going uh, to be easy without the structure of school. So we, parents, caregivers, neighbors, all have a responsibility to connect our young people to the vast resources that are available to them. And so while we have our government teams and they are working together, we're counting on the community uh, as well. We all need to work together to keep our students safe. Uh, so with that, I now want to turn to um, to hear from some of our guests. First, Director Freeman. Uh, then we're going to talk to Chancellor Farabee. Um, then we're going to answer any questions about the summer. Uh, we'll do a couple of demonstrations, then I'll come back to the podium uh, for other questions. Okay, Denny. Thank you, Mayor Bowser. Thank you, Mayor Bowser. Thank you, Mayor Bowser, for your investments in us. And we're just truly excited and we appreciate you and all that you've done for us. I want to thank um, Deputy Mayor Paul Kine. I want to thank my colleagues in the Deputy Mayor of Education Cluster, Drs. Fairby, Grant, and Unique Morris Hughes. We are the cluster where you can discover, learn, work, and play. And we're grateful for that. That's coming to a t-shirt near you. <laughs> As you may know, being a major part of the number one park system in America for three years in a row is because of innovation. And so Mayor Bowser said we have to do something for our young people to combat learning loss coming out of COVID. And so we came up with Boost Camps. And what is Boost? Boost is educators meeting recreators and having innovators. And so we designed Boost to combat the learning loss in STEM and in STEAM and social emotional learning. And we have rocket camps, drone camps, uh, journalism camps, aeronautics, it, dream teams, challenge camps, CSI and medical science. And they're all infused with learning. We went on Aussie's website, we looked at the standards, and we made sure that you can come to a recreation center and learn how to do something fun where the learning is disguised. So give it up, young people. Y'all going to learn a lot. And you think you're playing. As I've said before, fun is serious business, and we do not play about how we serve our young people. And so DPR this summer, we've increased our camp slots a thousand more. Young people are going to Camp Riverview in Scotland, Maryland, completely free. They'll do archery, kayaking, sit around the campfire and get mentors, ment mentorship, engage and just do something different. So we're just so proud of our investments. Thank you again, Mayor Bowser and your rec for all investments and choosing DPR to lead the charge. And we boldly and gladly accept. Summer, summer, summer time in the city. And we have remixed it and called it Boost. And with that, I'd like to bring up my partner in this, uh, Dr. Farabee. Thank you. Thank you, Director Freeman. Uh, I also want to recognize one more time because we're in graduation season. We're celebrating the class of 2023. Give it up again for Raven, recent graduate from Banneker Academic High School. Say it with me, please. One more day. That's right, I said it one more day. So school ends for DC Public Schools 
on tomorrow. But as you heard from Director Freeman, we have a strong portfolio of options for students to be enriched and also to stretch them academically, socially, and emotionally as well. I want to thank Mayor Bowser for hosting us and bringing us together. Uh, it's always great to be with my cluster colleague, but more importantly, to help us get the message out what DC is offering our young people, not only to keep them safe, but to be focused on their well-being and to ensure that they continue to strive in school and outside of school. Importantly, you should know that we continue to see progress in our recovery. We know that we have more students that are on grade level, we have more students that are reporting that are stronger with their mental health, and so we see this as an opportunity to build a ramp and a bridge into next school year. And so we're reminding families that DPR has a strong portfolio of options. Thank you, thank you, Director Freeman. And many of those options are on DC public school campuses. So we're excited about the opportunity uh, to support our young people, again, academically, and also provide them some enrichment opportunities. DC public schools would officially extend its learning beginning in July, on July 3rd. And so we'll have summer learning opportunities. That's right. Uh, where students will either learn in a half day or a full day mode, but they'll have an opportunity uh, to go deeper in their math and reading concepts as well. And we'll have those sessions until August 4th. And then we'll have summer bridge activities for students that are going into new schools. So students going from elementary school into middle school and then from middle school uh, to high school. So we are really excited that parents and all of our supporters get an opportunity to support our young people over the summer. But please know that DCPS will be with you lockstep. Thank you. What questions do you have? Tom. Random crimes occurring in the city have police officers here. What is the security situation around these various summer camps? The question was about security around camps. Okay, let me first start with um, Director Freeman. Thank you. So during camping hours, um, locations where we have our young people, the facilities are closed to the public. They can come in for access for restroom use. But other than that, we don't allow patrons in the same space with our young people. Okay, Sam. Yes, Mayor. Um, I was looking at the stats on carjackings. Um, and I guess it was at 80, uh, 2018, there were like 140 citywide. And the numbers today, there were 120 in the last 30 days, 42 in the last week. Are we in a crisis? Tom, just Sam, I've been talking about um, being very serious about people who are breaking the law in our city for a number of years. I won't recount all of the efforts that we've made to bring the right people together to focus on repeat offenders, to focus on juvenile offenders, and to make sure that the law is being consistently enforced and prosecutions made. We continue to work on all of those things. I am pleased that the council is having a hearing on my bill, on a safer, stronger bill on this Tuesday, I think. Uh, and I hope that they uh, move urgently to get something done. Uh, in the meanwhile, um, the deployment strategies that MPD uh, is putting in place, I, I'm going to have the chief talk more specifically about that uh, and continue to ask the public for its support. Chief. Thank you, Mayor. We, Sam, were you asking about carjacking specifically? This is a, a great a venue to talk about the juvenile space. A lot of our recent carjackings have been committed by young men and women that are 14 and 15 years old. Uh, we had a spate of carjackings that occurred in the middle of the night that the same group of people uh, were involved in from 2.30 a.m. to 5.30 a.m. These are 14 and 15 year olds that are not at home, that are not with their parents, they're not with guardians, they're not in safe spaces and they're not accountable to anyone. And that large number is really due to a small amount of, of young people that are out there. So as we talk about juveniles having uh, 
outlets this summer, I mean, that's very, very important. But I really want to ask the parents that are out there and the guardians that are out there, when it comes to 10 p.m., ask where your children are. They shouldn't be out unattended without activities, without something to do, in a safe space. We need better for our chil children than committing armed carjackings and armed robberies. But your initial question was the numbers. The numbers are due to a very small amount of people that are committing the largest amount of crime. I think we've made some significant arrests recently. I can't discuss them because they're open investigations, but um, our police department, our carjacking task force, our federal partners, our patrol officers, uh, every single day we're tracking this. So um, go ahead, Sam. Is that the number of arrests have gone down compared to last year? Ongoing investigations. Right, we pick up additional carjackings and robberies, and I mentioned once we get a chance to close them, fully close them, you'll see the, the numbers of case close go up. Hi, my name is Ms. Hardy. Um, I run an organization uh, called Guns Down Friday, uh, and the two young men that were shot this week, uh, they were in my program, Kevo, DeMarco. When I think about them, I just think about DeMarco. He would call me every day, Miss Hardy, what, exit, what, what can we do? What is it to do? These kids were killed in front of their home. In front of their home. This neighborhood receives millions of dollars to service these kids. But these kids, I call them the stoop kids, and we have stoop kids in every community. They're not making it to these programs. They're afraid to walk to the rec centers. Like, then this is just a comment. It's really not anything to say, but like, it, it's something else that needs to be done. The May mayor, I love your work. I love what you do, and I mean this. I've been, you know, I've been working in this community for a long time, but I just feel like we're missing it somewhere. We're missing it. And, and I want to be a part of the solution. Thank you for that. And, and thank you for convening a program. Thank you for seeing those young men. Um, I can't imagine cousins, um, sisters uh, going through this experience. It's devastating to us all. Chief, I don't know if you have any more uh, to brief out on the investigation. Just very limited on the investigation. We, we are making progress in that case. Um, there is a reason to believe these young men were in conflict uh, with other groups, um, but I'm not going to be able to comment on that much more. But generally speaking, I think we really need to look at what our young people are doing online, um, their social media accounts, their Instagram accounts, and just the back and forth they're having with our individuals, right? I think we pay for these phones. I have three DCPS kids too, and I'll go through their phone in a heartbeat to make sure I know what they're doing and who they're connecting with. If they're in conflict with other neighborhoods or other people, and there's something that we can do to bring conflict resolution to these situations, those two young men losing their lives in the latter part of the evening in front of their home is unacceptable. And we'll do everything we can to bring that case to closure. Go ahead. I know we, uh, we put it on the parents a lot, but when I think about these kids, both of their parents aren't in their home. So it's, to, you know, we're doing all we can, all we can to stop these kids. We're doing all we can. Thank you for that. Yes. Just to follow up on uh, what Ms. Hardy was mentioning, a couple of weeks ago, the D.C. Council, when it was finalizing the budget, um, had a discussion prompted by Councilmember Trayon White about spending, um, about funding for new rec centers in Ward 8 specifically. Um, what are your, what's your take on that? Does Ward 8, do, does Ward 7, do other parts of the city need more rec centers so that kids aren't walking across kind of contested turf and can get to a rec center that's way closer to their house? Um, what, what do you think about Trayon White's um, proposal for these? Well, I, I commend Trayon for being in community and being um, sensitive to what people are, are asking for. I would probably more associate with what we just heard that we can have a rec center and have kids in need never step foot in it. So that, that we may need more rec centers in more places. I don't want to discount that. 
but it's not the necessarily the answer to a kid that's in trouble because they're they're probably not connecting to those programs. Yes. Mayor, last year you abandoned, in a way, the summer crime initiative. I did what? You got rid of the summer crime initiative and incorporated it in some other programs. I don't think that's what, how we would characterize it now. I'll ask the deputy mayor to speak to that. So we have all different strategies. Last year, we did a year-long strategy, the Homicide Reduction Partnership Initiative, right? So that was how we were addressing hotspots or otherwise. This year, we've continued with what we saw with the success in those areas, right? The, we expanded our violent crime reduction strategy, which informed our hotspot policing. So what we're saying is rather than addressing six areas where we flood um, those areas with the types of resources you see in SCI, we're doing that across the city in three to four hotspots in each district because there are hotspots across the city right now. So it's not an abandonment. It's that we always have to be evolving how we police and how we work across the public safety and justice space. So I would say it's an evolution of strategies that we've seen work last year. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Madam Mayor, and to your, your team. Uh, congratulations on all the efforts you've made, particularly with Raymond. I live right up the street on Quebec Place, and I walk here every day on my way to Bernie's part now, Senior Center. Uh, doing a great job with the seniors, doing a great job with, uh, with Raymond. Thank you. I'm here today because we have a situation that has been brewing for three years with young men and women now Laudering at the corner of 10th and Quebec. Now, when, when we come home at night, my wife and my family, we, there's, no mar there's no parking for us. We have to park three blocks away. They laudar out here. We've had neighbors call. Each time we call to Metropolitan Police, the first question the dispatcher asks is, do they have weapons? Now, how in the hell would I know if they have weapons? And why is that even relevant? Now, we, we've called. I'm surprised I don't see any of my neighbors here. And I'm trying not to get emotional. But it's been three years. I mean, these kids are there at 4.30 in the afternoon to goddamn 4 o'clock, excuse me, to 4 o'clock in the morning. So I, and your units walk by, they drive I by. I got it. So yeah. I, I have your issue. And, I, the silver, and I'm the, sorry, I didn't mean to use that word. But I well, mean, what else? Okay. You come to these sort of ceremonial things and you hear all the good news that you're doing. And I, I congratulate you for that. I mean, I but think. But these are evident right here, ma'am. Okay, let these me. These are evident right here, let every me, day. Let me answer. Let me answer. I don't and think so there's we, an answer. We, I don't think there's an answer. I just want to come here. Okay. So my name is right here. I'm sorry, I got madam. It. You just wanted to. Well, I got I it. Know, I hear you. I don't you know then. if you got it. I, I just don't know if you got it. But you all have a great day. But this has happened for three years. Every night. Do I get to talk? Okay. Let, let's let's talk after. No. Okay. Yes. I have a. a I, I'm sorry. I can't hear you. Can you update us on the progress of, of finding a new police chief and a new gun violence director? And how is the sense of urgency increased given the amount of violence that we saw this past weekend? Well, regardless of what happens uh, on any day or weekend, we are urgently searching for our police chief and our process is ongoing. I don't have anything to report. Um, we will name an interim director for the Office of Gun Violence uh, and Prevention, and that um, we will we will start a recruitment shortly. Um, I, have, I have a question for the chancellor. Actually, um, beyond summer school and some of the DPR programs you mentioned will be mentioned on campuses, can you talk a little bit about what you view as your role in making sure that students have safe, productive things to do this summer, especially older kids we know can be more challenging to reach. Yeah, thank you for that question, Lauren. I also want to recognize that we do have some, some students with us today. I want to recognize the, the staff. I see Principal Preston from Dorothy Height. We have students from Barnard Elementary School as well. Um, the work of our school leaders, our team, my office, will continue with the public safety team throughout the summer. In fact, uh, Deputy Mayor Pia team and I have been talking recently about how do we get students uh, to and from the activities that we've been talking about today over the summer. But more importantly, if students aren't in school, uh, we still will do the work in supporting 
uh, the scanning of social media, uh, keeping both parties abreast of any potential conflicts. And the preparation for next school year starts day one of the summer break. And so we will work again with the public safety team, our school administrators, uh, to be proactive if we think about the opening of next school year, along with monitoring activity over the summer as well. Our school leaders and school communities often can be a resource in preventing or responding to any conflicts in the community, and we understand that we have that responsibility, and our school leaders embrace that responsibility as well. Like mental health support, like do you imagine counselors and social workers, social workers available over the summer to continue the care that students you know, ideally get in school? Yes, again, our, our work does not stop when the school year ends, and so we have a team of individuals that we can uh, launch out into the community in critical response needs or mental health needs. There's still uh, a tremendous amount of resources that we have in our partnership with DBH. Uh, there's still hotlines available to young people if they want or need to talk to a trusted adult. And so many of the resources that we offer during the school year will also continue throughout the summer. Okay, sorry. I'd like to ask about the summer employment program. Uh, is the pay sufficient for that program? It's six twenty-five an hour for fourteen and fifteen-year-olds, and nine dollars an hour for sixteen to twenty-one-year-olds. I had a chance to spend some time with some teens in the city recently, and this was their number one complaint. Oh, did the they have a, a higher offer someplace else? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to bet that they didn't. Not too many people are paying fourteen and fifteen-year-olds unless they're babysitters, and even then. They probably can't do it by themselves. Um, so we have a long tradition, 44 years, of the summer youth program. And uh, during Dr. Morris Hughes' tenure, uh, we have, we believe, right-sized the pay for our summer youth program. So let me have Dr. Morris Hughes weigh in. Thank you, Mayor Bowser. So not only have we right-sized the pay, but our 22 to 24-year-olds, which was an expansion um, due to legislation that uh, Mayor Bowser introduced, is now at minimum wage. So we will have 22 to 24-year-olds effective July 1st, making a little over $17 an hour. Um, I have an opportunity to speak to my colleagues across the country, and no other city is paying young people the way that we are, um, as frequently as we are, and I know that it is a concern of young people, but again, there's not a better offer anywhere else in the city. Um, so we think it's sufficient and it meets the needs of the program. Thank you. Thank you for that question, because I've been a, a summer youth employment parent, and I appreciate the pay. Uh, and I think it's important to know it is our young people's first experience with understanding financial literacy elements of budgeting, which is a critical part of what's required before they even begin work. But I think it's important to note that when students have an academic need, we also have what we have learn and earn opportunities as well. So if students can't work and we need for them to be in school, they can also earn uh, the wages associated with summer youth employment while they learn in our schools as well. Last question, we'll do the demonstration, we'll reset, then more questions. The only thing, the gentleman walked away before you answered his question, yes. but I'm still interested in the answer. Thank I mean, you, you had, Sam. You, <laughs> you, you still had, for example, that area there, and then you go like 16th and Good Hope Road, and in Anacostia, you have crowds of people just hanging on the street. I'm just we're making, um, so we're making improvements. So the, the complaint that you heard here, we sometimes hear, and I know you as a reporters here, that people are loitering. Um, he was concerned that the operators asked him about guns. They probably asked them if he was observing any criminal activity um, because it's not against the law to stand on the street in the District of Columbia. And so the, the police need to understand if it's a criminal nuisance, what's happening, and launch investigations. Um, and I'm going to stop talking about law enforcement strategies and let law enforcement do it. Um, I will say uh, we take very seriously if it is open air drug dealing or any other um, issue uh, public safety related. 
and the police have ways of investigating and deploying uh, to support that. I will ask the chief and perhaps um, others to talk more specifically about 16th and Good Hope, which uh, we are uh, approaching with several different strategies. Chief. So that area is one of our violent crime reduction partnerships area where we have um, both the 6th and 7th district officers working in that in conjunction with other city uh, agencies. And I, I, we're seeing the results since we started that this year. Um, our officers getting out of cars, engaging, other aspects of city government engaging, DPW. Uh, when we started this initiative, there's a lot of like just trash and like uh, just, you know, the, the view of, of that neighborhood was not appealing to anyone. Uh, and, and it's definitely gone for the better. So that constant engagement, not just by MPD, but uh, other city agencies is definitely uh, providing fruitful uh, gains there. Uh, while I'm standing here, I just want to talk about overall violent crime. Um, you had asked earlier about crime, is there a crime issue and things of that nature. So I went back and looked at our last 18 shootings. And just to say that number, it, it startles me, right? But you look at the last 18 shootings, and 83% of them took place in MPD's midnight tour of duty. 83%. That's late evening up till 5 in the morning is when these are taking place predominantly. So the public needs to know that when they move around the city in the middle of the night, what safeguards they should take place uh, as MPD continues to deploy properly. Um, during the day when people are at restaurants, at work, visiting the city, we have a high deployment and a, and a, and a good success uh, as far as engaging community. But those overnight hours, especially in the space of our young people, Right? We have a curfew on the books for young people that are under age 17. Yet time and time again, we see young people out in the middle of the night in areas like Good Hope Road and other parts of the city, uh, not just uh, one section of the city, but all sections of the city. We need our young people engaged and off the street. And if they're loitering in the middle of the night, that's something we can talk to them about. Um, but yeah, police, police officers are there to investigate crime. But hotspot policing and our philosophy in there is to engage people. So if we see people standing on the corner, I expect our officers to get out of their cars and talk to folks and see what they're doing. If they're engaged in criminal activity, there's something more we can do. If it's just being a nuisance, we're being a nuisance to them, right? If there's some uh, open air drug using or drug dealing, uh, something that we can we roll up on and we can't actively see, uh, we want to at least gauge those people. And if, if nothing else, it's an opportunity to talk to our citizens and our residents. Okay, thank you everybody, and um, where are we going next?